good to see you all. Warm welcome to you. I'm just going to rattle through a few quick announcements before we start. Tea and coffee tonight. If anyone would be able to serve tea and coffee tonight, that would be much appreciated. Jenny's not feeling too well, um, and she was due to be doing it. Um, so if you can, please just pop your name down on the rotor in the foyer. That'd be great. Also, um, the ladies' evening. There's a list in the foyer. If you want to do the craft part of it, and you want to make the coasters, then you need to get your name down today. Sharon needs to know today, ready to order the materials. If you're just turning up without making the craft, then that's fine. You can, that can be like a last minute thing, so not a problem. Finally, those who've had a DBS through the church should have received an email, hopefully, this week about safeguarding training. And this is really important to us as a church. Um, Psalm 121 says this. Lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. That word keeps can also be translated <coughs> safeguards. Safeguards. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. The Lord safeguards his people. And Proverbs 31 says, Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up. And judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. You just listen to the words of Jesus in the Gospels and you see his heart for children, for widows, for the fatherless. It comes out loud and clear. And we are to be like him. So we're not doing the safeguarding stuff because it's law, although that is important. We're doing it because it's biblical. And it's important to God. Therefore, it's important to us at Wellington Chapel. Okay, sorry for a little mini rant to start the service, but it's, it's really important, that's what I'm trying to say. Okay, I don't have any other announcements unless anyone else does. No? Okay. Let's pray, and then we'll sing our first couple of songs this morning. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you that we are able to come to your house and worship you in spirit and truth. We thank you for fellowship. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for your spirit. And Father, we pray that you would pour out your spirit upon us today, this morning and tonight, that we may see Jesus and hear from him today. And that by hearing from him, we will be changed by him. Lord, we need to change. And we pray as well, Father, for those who are unwell at the moment. We pray uh, for John. Uh, who's due to be leading the service this morning. We pray that um, you would draw alongside him, Lord, that you would comfort him. We pray for Jenny, who's not feeling well. We pray for, for Edna, a few doors down, who's been in and out of hospital so much recently. We, we pray for, Lord, that the many people that we receive information about on the prayer chain, near and, and far away, family members, friends, people sometimes we don't even know, but we hear about who are in desperate need. Father, we pray that you would bring your healing touch. And Father, we pray as well that you would bring comfort, that you would speak to people. When we're frail and when we're struggling, when we're not well, Lord, sometimes we're, we're a bit more open to hear from heaven. And so, Lord, we ask that you would utilize those opportunities. And Lord, as we think about the many Christians gathering to worship you on this day, we join with them in praise in your precious name. We thank you, Lord, for who you are and who you've made your people to be. And we pray all this for your glory's sake. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're going to sing a couple of hymns back to back, far and near, and I will offer up my life.
Tonight, uh, we're going to be continuing through Revelation. So we've got to the bit now in the beginning of chapter 2, uh, where we're going to start looking at the letters to the churches. So uh, if you'd like to come along tonight, 5.30 for refreshments, and the service will start at 6 o'clock. So everyone's welcome. Okay, children, you know the drill. Memory verse. Who's going to brave it this week? So we're going to start, if we have anyone brave enough, with someone who hasn't yet had a go. You want for it, Ophelia? Is that Ophelia there? Yeah. You going to give it a go? Mum or Dad can come up with you and help if they can. <laughs> but they may not get any chocolate. Oh. I know. <laughs> <laughs> right. Loud as you can. Actually, do you want to borrow my microphone, Ophelia? Do you want to borrow a microphone so it's a bit louder? Pull this out a bit. This is my intestine I'm pulling out here. Yeah. Say something knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, the power, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. Excellent. Well done. <laughs> Fantastic. What are we going for? Sweets or chocolate? Chocolate? Okay, who's next? Is that Lucci and Ellie together? Come on then. <laughs> We're kicking for us away. Right, you ready? No, you're not facing this way, you face that way. Who's going first? Lucci. <laughs> no. Not having that. Okay, come on then, loud. Say it loud then. It's been challenging for you because you've had very slightly different translations from when I did it the first day with you, and we, we said it out loud, and then on this as well, and then in Sunday school. So there have been slight little changes of words, but the point is the same, isn't it? The point is that we all, children and adults, we all want to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, but we don't just want to do it now. <coughs> We want to do now what we're going to do forever. Amen to that, isn't it? Amen to that. Okay. We're going to watch our, our little song again now. If you want to sing along this time, you can. <coughs> Not just children, adults can as well. If you're struggling to remember our verse, our text for the year, then this will help you, I promise you. It's annoying, but it will help you. <laughs> so let's... Yeah. She's getting started up in this place. You guys ready to come in? Right here. 
our Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ, to Tipex hasn't been found yet. <laughs> okay, well done, children and adults. We're going to sing again now, and as we sing, the children are going to go out to Sunday school and crash. And for the older children that are staying in the service, you should have a handout as well. If you haven't got one, um, then they should be in the foyer, okay, just to help you with the sermon today. But let's stand and sing, Guide Me, O Thou Great Redeemer.
Okay, if you'd like to turn with me to God's Word, if you're using the Church Bibles, page 201, Judges chapter 2. So before we get to the individual judges, we've still got this awkward section from verse 6 of chapter 2 through to, to verse 5 of chapter 3. And it's given us a bit of an overview of what's going to happen in the period of the Judges. So chapter 2, verse 6. When Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel went each to his inheritance to take possession of the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years. And they buried him within the boundaries of his inheritance in timnath Heres, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gash. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed down to them. And they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them. And he sold them into the hand of their surrounding enemies so that they could no longer withstand their enemies. Whenever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them for harm, as the Lord had warned, and as the Lord had sworn to them, and they were in terrible distress. Then the Lord raised up judges, who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they did not listen to their judges, for they whored after other gods and bowed down to them. They soon turned aside from the way in which their fathers had walked, who had obeyed the commandments of the Lord. And they did not do so. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge, and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. But whenever the judge died, they turned back and were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods, serving them and bowing down to them. They did not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he said, Because this people have transgressed my covenant that I commanded their fathers and have not obeyed my voice, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations that Joshua left when he died in order to test Israel by them, whether they will take care to walk in the way of the Lord as their fathers did or not. So the Lord left those nations, not driving them out quickly, and he did not give them into the hand of Joshua. Now these are the nations that the Lord left to test Israel by them. That is, all in Israel who had not experienced all the wars in Canaan. It was only in order that the generation of the people of Israel might know war, to teach war to those who had not known it before. These are the nations, the five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and the Sidians and the Hivites who lived on the Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal Hermon as far as Lebo Hamath. They were for the testing of Israel to know whether Israel would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. So the people of Israel lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And their daughters they took to themselves for wives, and their own daughters they gave to their sons, and they served their gods. Father, please help us to navigate through this difficult chapter Help us to relate to the Israelites back in those days. Help us to learn from the mistakes that they made and also learn from their faithfulness and the good things that they did. Help us not to detach ourselves because of the period of time that's passed between us. But instead, Lord, help us to see ourselves in their shoes and to relate to the God who is the same yesterday, today and forever. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So here we've got an overview, as I said a moment ago, of the book of Judges. And there's three kind of things that happen in a cycle. So this cycle just continues all the way through Judges. So it's disobedience, consequences, and then deliverance. And those are the three things we're going to look at, essentially. That's how we're going to break it up. So disobedience first, consequence, deliverance. Israel disobeys God. They do their own thing, and they're heavily influenced by the people around them who they've chosen to allow remain in the land that God had given them. And they disobey. And the consequence of that is God removes his hand of protection from Israel. So he says, I'm not going to save you anymore. I'm not going to give you that victory. And so the other consequence of that is unbelieving people rule over them. And they have their way. But then God sees the misery of his people, so he delivers them. Now, I believe in the sovereignty of God. I believe that he's in control of all things. I believe that he restrains evil in the world. I believe that he allows some bad stuff. And I know that's really hard for us to get our heads around, because even I often will read my Bible, or I'll just look around at what's going on in the world, and, and I'm uncomfortable with what he allows I'm uncomfortable and I don't understand all that's going on in the world, all that's gone on previously. And I'll often ask that question, Lord, what are you up to? What are you doing? Where is your hand in all this? And this little section, I know it might seem a bit intimidating when we read it in a big chunk like that, but this tells us what God is up to during this period in history, this, the chaos of the judges, it tells us, what, what is God up to? For everyone asking that question, it gives us a bit of an insight to it. So let's get straight stuck in. So first point, disobedience. There's two main areas of disobedience that we read about. Um, firstly, marrying the Canaanites. Israelites were, were intermarrying with, with the Canaanites. God told them not to do that. They didn't listen to him, did their own thing. But also then, that led to them worshipping Idols, worshipping so-called gods, fake gods that belonged to the Canaanites. And Baal, one of the, the gods we, that we read about here in Judges, he was the god of, of storm and sex. Uh, and the Canaanites, they were obsessed with fertility. So they, they, fertility of crops as well, fertility of livestock, fertility of family. Absolutely obsessed by it. And then Ashtaroth that we, we read about, she was like Baal's female counterpart, if you like. And so the fertility of the land, the fertility of, of the livestock, the fertility of, of people was dependent upon the sexual relationship between Baal and Ashtaroth. I know this sounds absolutely bonkers, but this is what they believed, that there's these, this male mini-god and a female mini-god and... and you know, if they're getting it on together really well, then that means the land's going to be fertile. And the way that the human worshipper helped was that you would visit the, the kind of shrine, I suppose they would have called it, and you would then have sex with a temple prostitute. And that was your way of helping to fertilize the land. You're helping Baal and Ashtaroth. Because the man would represent Baal or Baal, and the, the lady would represent Ashtaroth. And that's what's going on. <laughs> this is the chaos that's going on. So you would hope that the Israelites would look upon that and say, that's insane. That's disgusting. That's insane. That's horrible. Not having anything to do with that. They might not have agreed with it theologically, but practically, I think they thought, I quite fancy that. Sounds quite good. And so they did it. They joined in in that practice. Now, you might just say, oh, it's just, it's just sex. It's just a physical, sinful desire and all the rest of it. Not that sex is a sinful thing in itself, obviously. But in this situation, it is. But it's deeper than that. It's more corrupt than that because that name, Baal or Baal, is the Canaanite word for Lord. Remember in chapter 1, that guy, Adonai Bezek, 
You might think, oh, he's a horrible bloke. He chopped off the, the thumbs of kings. He's just a horrible person. It was deeper than that because his name, Adonai, means Lord. So there's something more cynical going on behind these practices. There's something dark. It's a spiritual darkness behind all this. And it's dangerous. And so this generation of Israelites, they they forgot about the Lord and they just served these little mini-lords, these little fake puppet gods. And God calls this behavior, this adultery, this prostitution, He says in verse 17, they hoard after other gods and bow down to them. This is a spiritual adultery that's going on. And God wants us to to love him the way that a faithful bride loves a husband. But Israel was essentially a married prostitute. They're in covenant with God. They're in a marriage agreement. But Israel was cheating. And God was remaining faithful the whole time. Hosea is probably springing up in your mind right now. And in chapter 2, verse 13, it says, she, that's referring to to Israel, she burned incense to the Baals, she decked herself with rings and jewellery and went after her lovers. But me, she forgot, declares the Lord. Forgot about her husband the bridegroom. Jesus is our bridegroom if you're a Christian. We're married, we're in covenant with God. So when we're not, when we just forget about him, we forget about our first love, which we're going to cover a little bit tonight, Revelation 2, we're not distinct anymore. We're just like everyone else. We don't stand out in any way and we call this a religious syncretism. It's where it's a, a little bit of a pick and mix. It's a bit of that, it's a bit of this, it's a bit of that. And it's such a mishmash. It, it doesn't really stand out as Christian at all. This is really, really popular in a lot of churches today. But it's not just today. It's been going on since the beginning of time. It's not a new thing where people will present themselves as a church or a little mini cult that sounds quite Christian. And they'll say, well, yeah, of course we're Christian. We believe this. And you think, oh, right, okay, that that is Christian because we believe that. But then you dig a little deeper. It's like, and we also believe this. And you're like, whoa, that's not Christian at all. What is that? Oh, it's okay. We were just having a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And we get rid of the stuff that we don't want. (laughs) It's difficult. We don't like it. God says, I'm not having that. I want to be Lord of all your life. Every single part of it and he demands this radical separation this distinction and this is all a result of them not obeying him they did not drive out remember in chapter one they had that refrain that kept on getting repeated they did not drive out this peoples or these peoples and verse 10 frightens me the most of chapter two absolutely terrifying we'll read it again And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. A generation of churchgoers who don't know God. How terrifying is that? They turned up every week. They were there. They probably knew their Bible quite well. They they might have known the stories. They didn't know him. And Joshua is, again, the yardstick of obedience. And and his generation wasn't perfect. But on the whole, they served the Lord faithfully. That famous sermon in Joshua 24 where he he pleads with that next generation to turn away from all those foreign gods. All the living God's going to bring disaster on you. He says, yield your hearts to the Lord. Submit to him. Love him. And when we don't do that, when we don't yield the center of our being to God, we, we tend to then place something else on the throne of our heart. That becomes our God. And the next generation, they, they didn't yield to God. So they had other stuff that, that was the driving force behind their thinking and their practice and their words. It wasn't God driving them at all. 
It wasn't God that they were worshipping. But whose fault is that? Was it the fault of this next generation, or was it the fault of the generation who didn't pass these things on to the next generation? Now, it doesn't tell us in the text. But Joshua's generation, as as obedient as they were in, in some practical things, maybe they were so obsessed with obeying what God had told them to do in one area, they neglected the next generation. And that's a massive danger for us today. Huge danger. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give to you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And at the end of chapter 6, it talks about when your, your son gets older and he starts asking questions. Tell them. Tell him what God has done for you. Tell him. And how important it is to keep his commands. Now, Deuteronomy 6 is not talking about having family lectures where we sit down and lecture our children. It's a lot more difficult than that. Sit, walk along, lie down, get up. It's talking about everyday life. It's talking about the stuff that we do day in, day out, the normal routine of life. Impress upon being a Christian, upon your children, upon this younger generation, by what you do, by what you say, by how you do it, by how you say it. That's important, and we have to be consistent with that. It's easy to be godly for 10 minutes giving a lecture, isn't it? Kids, sit down, be quiet, I've got something really important to tell you. We're super holy for 10 minutes. We're in teacher mode, you listen, I'm the adult, you're the child, you obey. God says so. Easy to do that. What's a lot more challenging is being consistent in our faith, being obedient in our faith to God and our children seeing our obedience, seeing our love for him and it wowing them so that they want to know the God that we know. That's a lot more difficult. And we don't just speak about him, we, we share our personal experience of him. This word know, we've spoken about it many times, it's an intimate word. It's about relationship. So we're open with our struggles. We're we're transparent about how we fail. We mess up. We're not perfect. We're transparent about repentance and how that works every single day. And so when we express our faith, we, we link in with the faith of these past generations of Christians. But we demonstrate that our faith right now is is active. It's it's effective. It's alive today. There's a, a group of people in Uganda called the Baganda, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, apologies if I'm not, but they have this very famous saying, which I read about some time ago, and this is the saying, don't despise history, for without it, there will be no anchor for our present and no compass for our future. Don't despise history, for without it, there will be no anchor for our present and no compass for our future. I'm sure this generation after Joshua, they, they knew stuff about God. They knew the stories, but they didn't know him. He wasn't central in their life. He wasn't precious to them. They didn't rejoice in what he'd done for them. And it reminds me of uh, 1 Samuel 2, where Eli's sons, that they're, they're serving in the temple. They're, they're priests. And they knew loads of stuff about God but they had absolutely no regard for him at all. They didn't care for him in any way. God just didn't matter to them. They they never ever wondered, what are you up to, Lord, in this situation? They didn't care. Dangerous, really, really dangerous. And so I think how we apply that as a church today is we avoid raising children that just know a lot of theology and know reality of God. Yes, we want to teach the children 
memory verses. We want to teach them Bible stories, but we also want to show God to them in our lives. And I'll tell you something, us parents, we can't do it alone. I can't do it by myself. I'm not capable of fulfilling Deuteronomy 6. Not only do I need the help of the Holy Spirit, but I need your help as well. Even in a Christian married couple, where there's two of us, Carla and I can't do it ourselves. We need the church's help. That's the beauty and benefit of being part of a local church family. The other adults invest in the children of the church in that next generation. It's our responsibility. And we want them all to get to the point that the Apostle Paul did in Philippians 3. I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Basically says, everything else that I know is absolute garbage compared to knowing Jesus. It's it's almost pointless compared to knowing Jesus. That's how much it means to him. Okay, the consequence... The consequence of disobedience essentially is oppression. They're oppressed. So verse 11, the Lord says that they did evil. Verse 12 says they abandoned the Lord. Verse 13 says they abandoned the Lord. And when the Israelites behaved in this way, they got used and abused, basically. Because sin, that's how it works. It looks attractive. It looks good. Everyone else is doing it. I want to join in. And so the Israelites joined in and all these Canaanite practices... And they're the ones who ended up getting burned. They saw the emptiness then, eventually, that these promises were not as good as they looked on the outside. And you end up becoming enslaved and vulnerable to that sin. So if you have a look at verse 14, we'll read verse 14 and 15 again. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel... And he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them, and he sold them into the hand of their surrounding enemies so that they could no longer withstand their enemies. Whenever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them for harm, as the Lord had warned, and as the Lord had sworn to them, and they were in terrible distress. So three things he did. He handed them over, he sold them to their enemies, and his hand was against them. Now, we know from reading other parts of the Bible, God is a jealous God. He wants you all for himself. So when you come to church on a Sunday and you worship him and praise him and then you do the odd prayer and Bible reading in the week and say some Christian stuff and read some Christian books, but then alongside that, we're worshipping other things and little lords and pretend God. And we have idols in our heart and we share our affection. We cheat on him. And we don't just cheat on him. It doesn't just offend God, but it affects us in a negative way. And God, that hurts him because he loves his children so much. He he doesn't want to share us, but he also doesn't want to see us get taken advantage of via this fake hope, empty promises, liars. And the problem is, the more that we do this kind of behavior that the Israelites are doing, the more that it becomes a deeply entrenched habit. We get into really bad habits, and then it makes it almost impossible to do good. If you you have a look at verse 16 to 19 again, I'm not going to read it again, but you just see this pattern of behavior and this repeated behavior. It's, It's normal. To sin and to do all this wicked stuff is just normal. Jeremiah 13 says, Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Neither can you do good who are accustomed to doing evil. (coughs) Now part of the judgment that God gives is he allows the Canaanites victory. So he essentially gives them the victory, which means the Israelites lose. And the Lord tests his people. And he uses the Canaanites to test his people. And this is where things start to get really uncomfortable, where we think about, could God do that to me? Could he allow me to go through a really difficult period in my life, and I have really difficult circumstances, and he he would do that to, to test me? To test my faith? Yeah. Yeah, he might. He might do that. 
verse 21, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations that Joshua left when he died in order to test Israel by them, whether they will take care to walk in the way of the Lord as their father did or not. What does a test do? Well, I know children who are present, you're probably thinking, I hate tests. I look back on my life, I hated all the tests as well, but tests do force you to study, to be disciplined. They force you to learn, don't they? Are we going to learn? Will Israel study this situation and realize why they're not winning the battles anymore? Why they're not getting these victories? Will they learn from their mistakes? Will they seek deliverance? Maybe you're a Christian and you're here today and you're currently a prisoner of sin and you feel a little bit like these Israelites as well. You feel like you're surrounded by people who do certain things and behave in a certain way and you didn't realize how much of it before but, but you've started to, to realize actually maybe this is a test and maybe I'm not passing this test at the moment. I'm adopting more of these ways from the people around me than I should be and I need to let some of that go. I need to kill it. And there's only one way we can, we can do that, and we come to the cross to kill sin. 1 Peter 2.11 says, Beloved, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Okay, last point. Deliverance. So disobedience, consequence, and now finally deliverance. When Israel does realize, so there is a pattern of behavior, but when Israel does get to the point where they realize the error of their ways and they kind of repent, God sends a judge. He sends a chosen judge to deliver them and to rescue them. But here's the problem, and this is where you'll feel uncomfortable again when we go through the book of Judges. There'll be this sense of, yes, God's raised up a judge and he's rescued the people. Come on. But then you look at the judge, and you don't even have to look that carefully, and they're pretty wicked. Even the judges are corrupt, liars, adulterers, and it just, something doesn't sit quite right with us because we're like, what? This is the best of the bunch that God's raised up. And he is delivering his people, but look who he's using to deliver his people. And even here in chapter 2, deliverance doesn't make a lot of sense to us. So if you have a look at verse 14, the beginning of verse 14, put that together with the beginning of verse 16. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel and he gave them over to plunderers. Verse 16. Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Like, what? The one who gave them into the hands of the plunderers saved them from the hand of the plunderers. The hand that's against them is nevertheless mysteriously and majestically for them. God's heart is stirred for his people even when his people are cheating on him. Even when our hearts are far away from him, his heart is for you. He never stops loving you even when your love for him is so cold. That's how great his love is. Is, And we're supposed to look at each and every one of these human judges and say, I need something more than that. I need something more than a temporary deliverer. Because every time the deliverer dies, they stay dead. And everyone goes back to how they were before. We need a deliverer who, yeah, is willing to lay down their life for us and lead us and deliver us, but who doesn't stay dead can rise above even death. We need a leader who doesn't compromise purity to gain victory. 
we need a leader who can deliver the soul and not just the body. And that's why God had to come himself. And that's what all these judges are pointing to. They're pointing to the ultimate one who has enough power to deliver us from sin, who has enough compassion to forgive us our sins and have a, has enough love to lay down his life for a people who constantly cheat on him. And that's why the Father sent Jesus. Lamentations 3 says, Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. Our brothers and sisters that we read about in this period of history, they waited for the anointed one. That means the, the one full of the Spirit. And they waited. And when he arrived, the ones who knew about him rejected him. But the ones that had a relationship with him, the ones who knew him, they were saved by him. You shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Turn with me to Psalm 106, and we'll finish with this. It's on page 506, the Church Bibles. I'll read from, from verse 34. They did not destroy the peoples as the Lord commanded them, but they mixed with the nations and learned to do as they did. They served their idols, which became a snare to them. They sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons. They poured out innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood. Thus they became unclean by their acts, and played the whore in their deeds. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against his people, and he abhorred his heritage. He gave them into the hand of the nations, so that those who hated them ruled over them. Their enemies oppressed them, and they were brought into subjection under their power. Many times he delivered them, but they were rebellious in their purposes, and they were brought low through their iniquity. Nevertheless, he looked upon their distress when he heard their cry. For their sake, he remembered his covenant and relented according to the abundance of his steadfast love. He caused them to be pitied by all those who held them captive. Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the nations that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Blessed be the Lord the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting, and let all the people say, Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, that's what we're going to do now. We're going to stand and sing and ask this question as we praise God. We're not going to ask it to each other, because the Bible says that's what we do. We don't just sing praise to heaven and to God. We also sing to each other. And we're going to ask that question, who is there like you? It's a rhetorical question because the answer is no one. Absolutely no one. Let's stand and praise.
Jesus, we thank you that you have delivered us from the dominion of sin and death. Lord, that you have paid the price that only you could pay. That you did it with full integrity, that you did it with purity, that you didn't stay dead, but you rose again on the third day in great power and victory. And you share that victory with your people, your children, your bride. Lord, may we take our calling to be pure and holy seriously. Lord, help us to live lives that represent you well. Help us, Lord, to invest in this next generation. Help us, Lord, to walk in obedience. And even when we don't and there's consequences that we we evaluate that. We see this is a test. We can, we can put this right. We can repent. We can turn back to you. And we can know blessing and life again. But Lord, we thank you most of all that you have such compassion on your people. And despite our unfaithfulness, you remain faithful. We love you and we praise you this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.